श्रीमद भगवद गीता चैप्टर वन वर्स फोर्टी फोर सो चैप्टर वन is setting the problem statement the problem that shri krishna proceeds to address and solve in the next 17 chapters right so we have uh, looked at the state of duryodhan we have addressed his predicament in detail and then with great interest we have tried to figure out arjun's mental condition where is arjun coming from what are the prejudices he is holding see please understand any story worth listening to and any scripture worth reading ultimately has to be about liberation of the ego from its own ignorance there is no other spiritual subject or topic there is no other spirituality this is the very basic and very strict definition of spirituality to address the ego's need to be free from itself the liberation of the ego from its self created world of ignorance that self created world has relationships ideas thoughts memories desires principles so much else if ever you come across a story or a book of sutras a book of concepts or principles this is the touchstone this is what you should ask yourself are the three present here are the three present here if the three are present in that story or something then that story has a spiritual purpose otherwise that story is just entertainment bogus which three are we talking of the ego the truth and prakriti right these three have to be necessarily present in the story in some form or the other in the name of some character or the other if you do not find these present and if you do not find the story useful in terms of guiding the ego towards the truth then we said the story is just uh, spiritual entertainment are you getting it so arjun's ego it's uh, 
predicament and its universality are at uh, display in chapter 1 right and usually chapter 1 is ignored because krishna does not speak in this one hmm? arjun just keeps expressing his situation and that is exactly the reason why chapter 1 is so extremely important because we get to know what all is not right the ensuing 17 chapters are a very compassionate attempt to set right what is not right and our first relationship as we are is with what is not right simply put we are closer to arjun than we are to krishna are we not is our situation similar to that of uh, arjun or rather identical with that of krishna arjun so we have to see the various facets of arjun's personality here we have to look at the nuances of his argument. We have to see what all he does to resist Krishna. And only then we will understand why Krishna addresses him and teaches him the way he does uh, in the next uh, chapters. Right? So here is, uh, here is uh, the next uh, argument that Arjun comes up with. We'll also uh, uh, take a look at what all he has already said, but let's begin with this one first. We have heard, Krishna, that uh, departure to hell hmm, and dwelling in hell become unavoidable for those in whose uh, families the religious traditions are not followed. Hmm? And which religious traditions is he talking of? Because if you do not understand what Arjun is supporting, you will not understand what Krishna is destroying. Which religious traditions is he talking of? Arjun is talking of everything from misogyny to casteism to superstition. That's what Arjun is supporting and it will come as a surprise to most of us that the lecture of Gita is actually principally addressed to take care of these things. Atmagyan is the medium, self-knowledge is the way these problems have been tackled. Self-knowledge is the tool, the weapon used to slay these enemies. What are the enemies? We have to be very careful in looking at Arjun's attitude. That's where you come to see what the enemies are. First of all, the enemies lie in the body. So Arjun is talking of moha. And it is inferable that Arjun is also experiencing bhai. So attachment and fear. Huh? Attachment and fear. So attachment and, and fear represent the physical tendencies that Sri Krishna is fighting through the Gita, through this uh, treatise on self-knowledge. Huh? At the physical level, Sri Krishna is fighting physical tendencies. And then after that, there is a lot at the mental level that Sri Krishna is fighting against. What is it at the mental level that Sri Krishna is fighting against? Arjun says, you see, if I fight, if I fight, all the Kshatriya men will be gone. And if the Kshatriya men are gone, 
their women will become corrupted now this is not a very dignified way of looking at women or is it their women as if men own women and as if women have no discretion no life of their own this is a very objectified way where women are things to be possessed things to be possessed that if left unpossessed would uh, tumble into some kind of moral abyss i'm getting it and this you see has also to an extent rather largely been the conservative and orthodox attitude towards women that women should always be owned and possessed and never allowed any freedom and this is not just something of a social custom all this exists squarely in written hmm? in in documents that we have somehow very surprisingly honored over the centuries women should not be educated women should not move out of the house women should not even have a teacher the husband should be the only teacher that the woman should have and if any man attempts to teach a married woman that man should be declared a fraudster because the only guru for a married woman can be her husband the only religious practice that the married woman is supposed to follow is serving her husband so what is dharma for her pati parayanata you take care of your husband and that is your dharma you don't need to read you don't need to do anything what is agnihotra for you household duties you understand agnihotra what is agnihotra yagya the the practice of havan so you don't even need to participate in that if you are washing utensils and uh, taking care of the babies that is your agnihotra so all that has been there and arjun is speaking from there so do you see who is it that arjun is representing arjun is representative of all that which is regressive in cultural thought and now do you see who the krishna of gita is he is a liberating force arjun stands for conservatism and orthodoxy and shri krishna comes as a force that liberates the mind from all that that's why chapter 1 is so important it clearly tells us where arjun is standing and therefore it tells us why the gita had to be spoken at all the gita was not for the purpose of atmagyan i am saying atmagyan or self knowledge has been used as a medium to address the very regressive mental attitudes that arjun is carrying and obviously the very human very physical problem of attachment and fear are you are you getting it huh? so if all the men get killed the women will go bonkers and the women will go and have sex with all the so called lower caste men it's it's shocking not that arjun is saying all these things but that how nothing has changed at all it's as if arjun is one amongst us it's as if time means nothing you see vedan says time is illusion now you see why you could have an arjun even today right here in the middle of us and he would probably say all these same things we find said here 
our women will get corrupted this kind of uh, uh, disgust towards so called lower castes that you do not want to see kshatriya women going to them even after your death you are saying as long as i was alive i had a particular attitude towards you and i want to ensure that even after i die you do not get to touch my women do you see and do you also see how wherever there would be ignorance you would have these attitudes dominating the mind hmm? so at that time at that moment rather arjun has a certain ignorance and that leads to display of these attitudes the same thing happens today as well wherever there is ignorance there would be these problems and these problems are in that sense eternal men will continue to look down upon women in some form or the other and men and women will continue to be each other's enemies men will exploit women in one way women will uh, react in a in a passive way and they too will want to avenge themselves so all this will continue one section of the society will continue to be averse towards another section there would be divisions galore in the in the name of caste or race or ethnicity religion obviously uh, language people will find some excuse to be divided huh? lack of self knowledge in arjun has these attitudes lack of self knowledge today has these same attitudes whereas we very well know that there indeed was historically uh, a battle fought by the name of mahabharat uh, this is not mere fiction it actually did happen it is a historical event and that that battle was uh, fought uh, no less than at least 3000 years back at least 3000 years back so what has changed over these 3000 years what has changed men will be men 3000 <laughs> years is nothing huh look at him he is not worried i'll die he is saying if i die my women will rush to that lower caste man i cannot allow that to happen so i'll not fight at all i'll not fight at all because if i die my women will run away so i'm prepared to give up on property prestige dharma everything but i cannot allow my women to run away and it's okay if she were running away to a kshatriya but if i die that would mean all the kshatriyas will also die so she she'll run away to some you know no 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 this this cannot be allowed this is the argument and then the argument is extended you see if she will go to some lower caste man she will get pregnant and how confident is he of the <laughs> if i die my woman goes there if she goes there she gets pregnant this is well said nothing to just laugh over i mean these attitudes exist and they don't just exist on the margins they are the mainstream attitudes and that's the reason why geeta is needed even today and then what will happen this this uh, rascal varun shankar will be born belonging to no caste at all hmm? because such things again in in our culture have been called as uh, uh, pratilom not to be allowed a lower caste woman can be taken away by a higher caste man and that is okay even the son that is born or daughter that is born will be accepted within the varna structure but if a higher caste woman mates with a lower caste man and some offspring is born 
then that fellow is not given any place in the society. Varna Sankar, you belong to no place. So first of all, this kind of tragedy, Varna Sankar, Varna Sankar. Incidentally, eugenics, the, the entire field of genetic studies has very clearly proven that when genes from two diverse locations, two diverse genetic locations meet, then the offspring is both healthier, more intelligent, more creative. So for humanity to progress, it is important that people from different places, different races, different uh, ethnicities, they meet and they converge. Huh? That's, a, that's even a biological imperative. So for example, an American meeting a Chinese is more likely to produce a creative offspring than an American uh, meeting with uh, her, uh, her neighbor. To some extent, there is also the reason why what we call as the Sanatan Dharm didn't extend beyond its geographical boundaries. Because you had set, set such strict conditions. You, know, you, you can marry only within, if you marry somewhere else, then Dharma is lost. So now how can you go to any other place? How can you go to China? How can you go to Arabia? How can you go to South? How can you go to Australia? After all, the land route was available from Persia to Middle East and from there uh, to the Levant and then to the uh, European landmass or from uh, Kashmir to uh, Central Asia and from there to Europe. Uh, Indians could have historically spread out but that never happened. Have you not wondered? Have you, have you not wondered why all the Hindus are concentrated only to one country called India? Why the spread never happened? And this you do not find in the case of any other major religion. Think of Christianity, think of Islam, think of even, uh, even Buddhism. Look at how they, they, they spread out. But when you have attitudes like this, then uh, spreading out becomes next to impossible. So now this Varna Sankar fellow is there and, and what is the problem if Varna Sankar is born? All the diseased, dead souls will go hungry and thirsty because they will not like to accept food from this kind of uh, 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 descendant. They will say we are, we are Kshatriya souls huh? and we cannot have uh, Shraddh and Tarpan coming to us from uh, this kind of a mixed breed. So we, we are not taking this and if that is not accepted then great misfortune will fall on the entire kingdom. The argument just goes on and on and on. And just think of Krishna at this moment. Think, what is this? Where is all this coming from? No wonder why he then had to purify Arjun's mind with a solid dose of Vedanta. We have heard, O oh Krishna, that dwelling in hell is imperative for those in whose families these so-called religious practices are not followed. And which religious practices is he talking of? All these things, offering the pind, the rice ball to all those things. And we have said that so the next thing also you discover here, a belief in heaven and hell after death. Now you know what the Gita is addressing, right? The Gita exists to destroy all such beliefs. No heaven, no hell. 
Vedant does not admit any heaven, any hell. Vedant also does not admit that uh, you can have salvation by following practices. Rituals, etc. have very little place in Vedant. And even if you are to follow rituals, you must very clearly know the symbolic meaning of those rituals. Blindly following rituals is something that Vedant never accepts. And mind you, Gita is a very important pillar of Vedant. And Arjun here is talking of blind rituals. He is talking of heaven and hell. And he is also using the word, it's an important word, Anushutam. I do not really know, but I have heard that gives you insight into how people follow the, the cultural dogmas. They do not know, they have just heard. And Arjun is being a bit tactless here. He clearly simply admits, I have heard that all this will happen. Though I have just heard, yet I very sternly believe in it. If you have just heard something, how is your belief in it so strong? If you have just heard of something, why have you not inquired? Why have you not asked for the source? And this is now a moment for all of us to ask ourselves a lot of that which we call as our religion or culture. How much of it do you know of from the primary sources? And how much of it has come to you just from hearsay? You understand hearsay? What? Aisa hota hai. When somebody tells you aisa karna hota hai, do you bother to ask? Where is it written? I'm asking you, most of us here are either married or would be marrying. When you were doing the circles round the fire and reciting the woes and the oaths, even at that moment did you bother to ask where are these shlokas, these mantras, these woes coming from? And that I suppose is an important uh, moment in life, is it not? You are getting married, right? You are getting married, do you bother to ask these, these mantras that we we are partaking in. The Pandit is saying a lot of things. Then the, bro the, the groom and the bride too have to follow what the uh, priest is saying and they too have to recite a, a few verses. Did you bother to ask for the meaning? That's how culture progresses. Not really progresses, I would say, keeps rolling on through the centuries. Nobody bothers to ask why we are doing what we are doing. Nobody bothers to ask, where is it coming from? Is it even written anywhere? Is it even written anywhere? Most of that which we follow, not only in India, actually this is a worldwide disease. Everywhere is it, it is much the same thing. Most of that which we follow is actually never coming from any primary source. It is just a custom. Nobody knows how it started, from where it came. And usually it has nothing to do with religion. It is just that, a custom. Custom. And it's indeed a very sad situation when customs become religion. Somebody asks you what is your religion and you start talking of customs. Traditions. Please see that the entire Bhagavad Gita is committed to destroying all those things. This is something that you would probably not have heard of before. Probably nobody ever told you the purpose of Bhagavad Gita. Probably no one ever told you why Krishna had to speak so much. And that's why I keep saying, please look at chapter 1. Then you will realize that the Gita is a rebellion. That the Gita is militating against something. That the Gita is not... Uh, just contextless discourse of Gyan. There is a very clear contextual emergency. And this is the context. Arjun's blind beliefs 
and naive commitment to superstition, culture, tradition, that is what the Gita stands to destroy. Now, this is something that uh, orthodox people will hate to hear. Because to them, even Krishna is a cultural symbol. They do not know the Gita. They just worship the stories around Krishna, right? So, so it will be very unpleasant to hear that uh, the, the real purpose of Gita, as is evident from the verses themselves, is that you should not blindly believe in anything. That you, that, that you must know who you are, you must know life before you talk of all these superstitions and heaven and hell and various other kinds of nonsense. Now do you see how dangerous the real meaning of Gita is? Now do you also see why it becomes extremely important for many people that the meaning of Gita is distorted? Because if the real meaning of Gita comes out, then a lot that is uh, respected, a lot that is continuing in the name of religion, all that will fall and collapse. Do you understand this, please? Hmm? So if all that has to be saved, then the Gita has to be compulsively misinterpreted. If you do not misinterpret Gita, then the Gita is a bomb. It will not allow your life to stay the way it is. Are you getting it? Remember, I don't own the Gita. The Gita belongs to all of us, right? We all deeply respect the Gita. The Gita means a lot to every human being and especially a Hindu. Correct? The Gita is a universal document. So if I'm if I'm trying to bring out the very obvious truth that the verses have, then this is not something personal. If the truth of Gita comes out, it is your truth because Gita belongs to you. This that I am talking of, this that I am emphasizing on cannot be a part of some personal agenda. Can it be? This is your document. This is your book. Who am I? I am nobody. But is it not important that you know the real meaning of your own holy book? Please answer. Yes. Is it not important that you must know the real meaning of your own holy book? So that's why looking at the verses with great attention is very important. Are you getting it? Hmm? Potentially, what we have in the form of scriptural legacy, the Upanishads, this Gita, several other Gitas, several other scriptures as well, all that is unimaginably high and sublime and wonderful. And we are blessed that all this was given to us, all this is still available to us, it's a blessing. And that's why it is all the more unfortunate and tragic that when all that when this is available, still we are following a thousand kinds of nonsense. Think of it, how mindless is it, is it not? The highest has been bequeathed to us. We didn't even earn it. It has been given to us for free. Huh? Like, like, like a loving gift from a doting grandfather. Huh? You grew up and you discovered you had a mansion for yourself. So that's what the Gita is. A, a loving gift. 
this is how tremendously lucky we are and yet how unlucky we are that instead of knowing the real works the real philosophy the crux of all religiosity we instead continue to call all kinds of mindless thoughts attitudes customs traditions as religion and if somebody asks you where is that coming from you do not know even you have this just one word to say anushutam i have heard i have heard why are we illiterate can't we read why have we just heard how many senses are there in the body just one just one gyan indri is there so how about this and how about this indriya call the call the mind why don't you read and why don't you apply the mind to see what your religion really is about and it's a great religion instead it has sunk into such disrepair and disregard that uh, it becomes uh, Uh, rather uh, rather sickening to look at it another word that arjun is using it's important he does not say this is what i have heard the next one he says he says vayam those who know even elementary sanskrit know what vayam means what is vayam so he is saying it's not that uh, only i am deluded at this moment there are only the two of them right arjun and krishna so if arjun says vayam who is it he is including in his circle of ignorance that's the way of the ego he says you see krishna we are about to commit a great sin arjun is telling we are about to commit a great sin and what's that great sin the great sin is when i follow your advice de facto arjun is prepared to declare even krishna sinner and that's what ignorance does when the grita is brought to you then you declare a sinner the one who brings the geeta to you even arjun is doing that why will others not do that that is how repulsive the ego is towards the geeta whenever the geeta will be brought the one bringing the geeta will have to face all these things mind you this is not duryodhan terming krishna a sinner this is arjun of all people arjun why because truth hurts the and when the ego is hurt it becomes disrespectful towards everything including the truth it says truth or no truth i don't bother i just don't like being hurt you have hurt me now i will not bother for your reputation or your place or whatever if you take care of me i'll order my or offer my salutations don't don't touch me don't hurt me let me be as i am and i'll keep respecting you oh krishna you are great but the moment krishna will act actually become active on you the moment krishna will actually try to transform you you will become inimical even towards krishna are you getting it huh and this is displayed not only in the first chapter again and again arjun says in the second third fourth chapters even later on krishna why are you deluding me this is a very disrespectful indictment is it not 
when you say you are deluding me you are de facto leveling the charge of uh, fraud against that person and that to a bloody fraud because you are pushing me towards slaying my own kith and kin hmm so just just uh, blindly uh, offering respects to the geeta without knowing the geeta will not help you have to understand the nuances of the story within you have to understand what really is going on and then the geeta opens up assumes a life for you and starts helping you oh it's a great sin we are getting involved in that we want to slay even our kinsmen our relatives just because we are uh, greedy for our pleasures and kingdom look at the look at the pretty direct uh, insinuation it's not just that i am greedy in fact i am not greedy because i am refusing to fight who is greedy then you are greedy greedy for for pleasures and greedy for kingdom and you can only you can only imagine how krishna must be feeling and smiling because he knows the ways of the ego if you know the ways of the ego nothing surprises you when you know the ways of the ego then you very well know that even your best friend and your most loved one can come to stab you if their self interest if their ego is hurt does not matter what your relationship with the other one is here these two are supposed to be best friends right krishna and arjun also krishna is arjun's guide and mentor guru actually and still see what arjun is saying he is his leveling solid accusations though in a polite way till now irrespective of whether it is expressed politely the fact is that these are uh, these are not things that you should want to say to a krishna hmm? and then truly the truth here is what you have brought me to is 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 not the truth the truth is that even if all these uh, kauravs the trashed sons were to kill me it would be better for me to simply die unarmed and unresisting rather than uh, fighting them killing them it's better for me that i get killed now this sounds pretty honorable right and people have credited arjun with a lot of ahinsa they have said look at arjun he is saying i will rather get killed than kill and that that comes from uh, verse 46 and from a few other verses also where he has said that you know these are exactly the people for whom you want to win kingdoms and uh, and bounties huh these are the people for whom you want to win wars now what's the point in winning wars if they are to be killed so that's something that he has previously said and here he is saying that uh, i'm such an apostle of non violence the very epitome of ahinsa that i'll not pick up my weapons even if they come and kill me 
and this gladdens the heart of those who keep parroting the principle of ahimsa without knowing what real ahimsa is. If one understands the Gita, one would say the sentiment expressed by Arjun in verse 46 is pure hinsa, pure violence. Whereas the war that Arjun is encouraged to fight, the war that Krishna wants Arjun to fight is actually ahimsa. It's just that appearances are deceptive. Sometimes when someone says, I will not fight, that is deep violence. And sometimes when somebody is fighting and shedding blood, his own and others, that is deep, deep non-violence. Sometimes it is possible. So, what Krishna is preaching here is actually non-violence. Arjun in his decision to not to fight is actually being quite violent. We'll, we'll come to that. We'll try to understand that when, uh, when we discuss the meaning of hensa, what does it mean? These days, a lot of people have suddenly started liking the Gita because they feel that uh, Gita licenses them to uh, fight and kill. So, Suddenly, from nowhere, they have developed regards for the Gita. Just as uh, we had uh, uh, one of Hitler's generals, or pro probably his uh, propaganda minister, he loved the Gita. Hmm? Who was it? Goebbels? Who was it? Somebody. A Himmler? Himmler? Somebody. He, he just loved the Gita. He said, Gita is wonderful. It is a certificate towards cold-blooded bloodshed. Just kill. So he said Gita is... So in the, in the same way, today a lot of people have started talking of Gita, thinking that the Gita sanctions violence. Well, it does not. What Krishna is preaching is pure non-violence. Any action towards the truth, anything that takes you towards the truth is ahimsa. But for you to take that action, first of all, you must know where your falsenesses are. Because the truth is intangible, ineffable. Moving towards the truth can happen only in one way. By shedding your own falsenesses. So, this war is about Arjun disregarding his physical impulses of attachment and fear. His social conditioning related to traditions, customs, superstition. And this war is also about keeping the greater public good in mind. This war is not being fought so that uh, the Pandavas gain the throne. This war is being fought so that the population of Hastinapur and by extension the, the population of this entire country get an able ruler. If someone like Duryodhan who has largely been on the site of uh, deceit and ruthless pursuit of self-interest becomes the king, then the quality of consciousness of the entire population goes down. 
so the war is being fought for the greater public good are you getting these are the reasons why krishna wants arjun to fight this war do not stop just because of your physical tendencies do not stop just because of your social conditioning keep in mind the larger public good keep in mind that the objective is beyond personal right so so this is not violence really taking care of somebody else's interests how can that be violence if you are thinking of the welfare of the population of an entire nation how exactly is that violence and it's not as if krishna wanted bloodshed he had tried his best to avoid war but if war becomes unavoidable does that mean that the nation should be left to somebody like duryodhan it would have been even better than fighting a war if somehow a peaceful solution could be arrived at but the peaceful solution never came in that situation one cannot let millions of people go to dogs are you are you getting it huh? so the first chapter is very important because it puts things in perspective you realize what is at stake you realize what is it that krishna has to fight against you realize the enormity of the challenge that shri krishna is facing and then you become more receptive towards the forthcoming chapters are you getting it and then finally the last verse arjun casts away his weapons his bows and arrows and just collapses he sinks down yeah. on the seat of his chariot his mind burdened with sorrow arjun has declared his intention i will not fight and uh, the declaration comes in a very visible shape the weapons have been kept aside and arjun himself just sits down sinks down rather that's how chapter 1 concludes yes questions please hello sir i wanted to understand how do you recognize what is cowardice because we we are involved in so many actions in life some being conscious and conscious aware and unaware and we sometimes want to do some certain things because we think it's valuable to do sometimes we don't know the real value of it so how to know what is real value and what is an act of cowardice and what is an act of knowing that this is a unnecessary thing to do and i'm not doing it how to know what is cowardice and what is not at the center of this is realization of what is important hmm? indifference courage or cowardice they can be determined only if you first of all know what is important hmm? dharma consists of these two knowing what is important and then living by it that's the very simple definition of dharma so know what is important that's only half the job done once you know what is important it is very likely you also see what is important is also difficult hmm? that is almost always the case what is important will not be easy right so it's important and it's difficult 
I still decide to go ahead with it. I'll face the challenge, I'll pay the price. That's called courage. I know it's important, but I develop cold feet. Hmm? I buckle down. That's called covered eyes. And not knowing what is important, that is called stupidity. Huh? How to rise above stupidity? I mean, no, no, ask. How can you know without asking? You have to keep inquiring. That's at the, that's the only method that Vedanta has. Ask. Ask by all means possible, at all times possible, to all people possible, and of course to yourself. Ask. Hmm? I think it's a long process, or is it not? Because Krishna Murthy says that it will happen now. Continuous. It depends on the intensity of your ask. Krishna Murthy encourages you to have. An infinite intensity that will clarify things instantaneously to you. Hmm? Mostly people do not have that, that kind of intensity. So, it doesn't matter. You remain continuously on the path of inquiry. That's okay. Hmm? 